So good evening, everybody, and welcome to the LSE. Welcome to those of you who are here at the LSE, and welcome to, to our audience online. Uh, thank you for joining us for this evening's event, Growing Apart, Cities, Nations, and the Future of Europe. It's jointly hosted by the LSE's European Institute and LSE Cities. My name's Simon Glendinning, and I'm head of the European Institute and Professor of European Philosophy here at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And I'm going to be chairing this evening. And in a moment, I'm going to introduce our speakers. But to uh, set the stage, I want first briefly to recall something about a European country uh, that might shed light on today's theme. If you look at a map of contemporary Europe, you'll see what Milan Kundera called a small country. Small country snuggled in between the northeast of Italy, the south of Austria, the west of Hungary, and the northern border of Croatia. It's Slovenia. And since 2004, it's been a member state of the European Union. It has a very small coastal littoral on the, on the Adriatic, but is mostly mountainous and forested. Its capital and largest city is Ljubljana. It is, as I say, a member state of the European Union, but it has only been an independent nation state since 1991 in the breakup of Yugoslavia. That is, in fact, the first time in history that these Slovene lands formed an independent nation state. It had previously been part of many different territorial configurations, part of the Roman Empire, part of the Byzantine Empire, the Carolingian Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, the Kingdom of Hungary, the Republic of Venice, the Illyrian provinces of Napoleon's first French Empire, the Austrian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and then Yugoslavia. And then finally, but as I say, for the first time in its incredibly long history, an internationally recognized independent state, a parliamentary democracy, a republic with a multi-party system. Now also a member of the EU, which perhaps complicates everything again. The state, however, is new. But its capital, Ljubljana, is old. During antiquity, there was a Roman city there called Imona. Ljubljana itself was first mentioned in that name in the first half of the 12th century. Situated in the middle of a trade route between the northern Adriatic Sea and the Danube region. It was then the historical capital of Carniola, which was part of the Habsburg monarchy. Indeed, it was under Habsburg rule from the Middle Ages until the dissolution of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the formation of Yugoslavia in 1918. Ljubljana, Slovenia. In a tweet publicizing the event tonight, our opening speaker, who we'll introduce in a moment, Ben Rogers, invites us to wonder whether something like Ljubljana is not as unusual as one might think. It may not be the exception, it may be the rule, is the quote in the tweet. Most European cities long predate the nations that dominate them they will also outlive them. Discuss. Right, let's do it. So our speakers in the middle here, Aziza Akhmush is the head of the Cities, Urban Policies and Sustainable Development Division within the OECD. Neil Lee at the end is Professor of Economic Geography here at LSE. He convenes the Cities, Jobs and Economic Change theme in the International Inequalities Institute. And just here to my left, right, is Ben Rogers, who's Bloomberg Distinguished Fellow in Government, Innovation, 
and Director of the European Cities Programme at LSE Cities. He's also Professor of Practice at the University of London and a former Director and Founder of Centre for London. Well, to get things going, we'll have a presentation from Ben, following which Aziza and Neil will both have a chance to respond. As always, at the end of our discussion, there'll be a chance for you to put your questions to the panel. And for those of you who are attending online, please post your questions in the Q&A tab, letting us know your name and affiliation, and we can select some for me to put to the panel later. One more thing, if you are a Twitter user, uh, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE Europe. And I'd remind you now to put your phones on silent so that not to disrupt the event. This evening's event is being recorded and hopefully will be made available as a podcast subject to no technical difficulties. But from now, we can begin with a presentation from Ben Rogers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, as Simon said, I, I, I joined LSE Cities a couple of years ago and I'm leading a new program um, on European cities, the European Cities Programme. We would have been struck by the fact that there doesn't seem to be a sort of major um, academic center focused on Europe's cities. So our plan is to fill that gap uh, with policy oriented research, with convening and with working with European cities themselves to help build their capacity through executive education um, and, and so on. So that's why we're here. And our program is generously sponsored by Bloomberg Philanthropies. So very grateful to them because uh, we wouldn't be here without their support. So yeah, I've got, a, I've got a few slides I'm gonna share with you. And actually they begin um, you know, very much along the lines, but probably a bit less eloquently than Simon set out, which is to make exactly this point. I stole these. I'm sure you didn't steal yours from Wikipedia, but I stole mine from Wikipedia, Simon. And this just makes the point that yeah, cities in Europe, um, most of them predate uh, nation states. As Simon said, many of them date back to the sort of classical period. Uh, most of the rest date back to the medieval period where you know they had a very very sort of distinctive culture built form economy they were sort of you know they were the uh, sort of cutting edge if you like of the sort of dynamic centers of of medieval europe um uh but but very roughly this is sort of cod history but from the sort of you know 17th 16th century onwards you know nation states begin to sort of grab the initiative with their own very distinctive cultures and institutions. I'm thinking about, you know, the huge standing armies and navies that, that the nation states and eventually um, the empires that some of them emerged into created or the sort of banks and the treasuries, the customs regimes, the, the, you know, the postal services, uh, latterly, the canal systems of canals, railways, and, and, and then the huge sort of bureaucracies and the large capital cities that they needed to run all these things and they you know they dominated and and overshadowed certainly Europe's cities but Europe's cities never went away um, and actually to a remarkable extent the cities that we know today you know, bear the imprint of those pre-modern classical and medieval foundations that's just true in their sort of size and distribution I mean Europe character, uh, you know, characteristically has a is, a is a continent of smaller medium-sized cities uh, in close proximity to each other, um, you know, unlike, say, it's the case in um, uh, North America. Um, but you also see these medieval characteristics reflected in the actual sort of built form of these cities, you know, with their sort of tightly knit historic centers, which are great for walking and cycling, um, for the sort of quite rich public realm, for that sort of crazy attractive mix of activities. Um, and the way that institutions, you know, the institutions of urban government themselves have, have survived this period and often still housed in the original um, buildings you know, built uh, in the medieval or early modern period, or in things like um, universities, you know, which are sort of distinctive creation of medieval European cities and which are incredibly important still to the economies, the cultures and so on of modern Europe. But when we're thinking about European cities and their sort of their survival through the period of the nation states. I mean, it's not just about preservation and institutions and, and built form. You know, they actually were important and I think much underrated agents of 
changed throughout this sort of modern period. I mean, it was cities that were again and again the forefront of philosophical, scientific, uh, technological, economic uh, revolutions. They were, you know, at the forefront of public administration. You know, it was it was cities, not nations, that you know made the pioneering moves around public health, uh, urban transport, domestic policing, and so on. Um, and they were at the forefront of sort of democratic innovation, you know, democratic uh, progress. And, you know, the history of Europe is sort of, um, you know, punctuated with these sort of, you know, cities uh, either leading revolutions or revolting against the, 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 their nation states. Um, I think, you know, sort of, you know, Paris Commune uh, or indeed the, not the English Revolution and so on. And, and that remains very much, and, and, and the role of particularly a public demonstration, which is a quintessentially urban thing. I mean, you can't really have public demonstration outside a city. Um, you know, absolutely central to European history, and paradoxically, in the age of the internet, when we can all connect to each other remotely, I think it's probably more important than ever today. You know, it was public demonstration that played a really, really important role in toppling Soviet bloc regimes. Largely peaceful public demonstration. It's been incredibly important, uh, uh, particularly in Ukraine. This is um, the 2014 sort of demonstrations, which did so much to define Ukraine as a sort of modern. I think the U Ukrainians' own self-understanding as a sort of modern uh, liberal European state. So cities have been very, very important. Um, and the counterpart to all this is, you know, what goes on with that outside cities, you know, which is a, if you like, I mean, it's a terrible caricature, but, you know, a, 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 a non-city space is a sort of broader nation, the country, which um, is being historically much more conservative, deeply religious, uh, and view and then view what's going on inside these cities, you know, often with sort of deep, misgivings. So against that background, you might ask, you know, what is new in our present um, uh, present sort of tensions and, and conflicts, you know, which I'm going to talk about in a bit between cities and nations. And, and I, I think it's important to say is that just to emphasize that these, some of these tensions have existed forever and there's nothing completely new in there. But I also think we are in a sort of slightly different moment. And I think the sort of, you know, the immediate uh, prehistory of that, this moment really is, you know, about the sort of the role of well, what happened in the middle of the early part, middle of the 20th century, um, when as a result of sort of empires and world wars, the sort of central state became incredibly strong, incredibly powerful. Um, and there was a sort of strong, almost sort of anti-urban um, framework of belief, you know, a, a, a faith in belief in, in feeding the way the slums, uh, creating urban space, embracing the car, embracing um, suburbia. And you know, cities sort of struggled and were neglected really under and the sort of distinct qualities of urban life were sort of neglected under that regime. And then there was a sort of turn, uh, probably in the big early 1980s onwards, largely driven, I think, by sort of deep economic forces about the way in which um, you know a new service and knowledge economy uh, enabled to sort of and encouraged and thrived in the reurbanization of, 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 the, of the economy. Um, and people began to sort of flood back to cities and cities began to grow much faster than the broader national economies. And this, this illustrates the point just in terms of um, employment. Uh, you can see that um, urban areas, urban uh, regions growing much faster than non-urban and then capital city regions um, growing faster still. And a lot of this sort of dynamism and a lot of the economic growth um, has been in, in capital cities in particular. And I mean, it's interesting to think about why that might be is something maybe I want, might want to talk about. But you know, as it, the, the overall pattern is, I think for the last, well, for no, the last 30 years, um, GDP has grown about 50% faster in urban than non-urban urban areas across Europe. But it's not just all about economics. It was the case that sort of policy helped a lot here. You've got um, uh, national governments reintroducing or establishing quite sort of pro-city policies and particularly planning policies favoring density, trying to stop sprawl. And you've got city governments themselves you know, getting their sort of mojo back and starting to invest in public realm, in public transport, in walking, cycling, in trying to create sort of characteristic European urban mix. And as a result of all of the stuff, you know, cities grew and you've got um, particularly young people moving back into cities and cities became younger. They also became a lot more diverse because characteristically immigrants, particularly immigrants from outside Europe, 
um, move back into cities. So as I say, there was a sort of new sort of excitement and dynamism um, in cities. And they gained sort of globally, I think, you know, a noticeable sort of soft power. I mean, even as sort of European nations just saw, you know, their power decline on the global stage, um, European cities, you know, uh, become sort of meccas for, for tourists, for, for students, you know, for, for migrants, for investors. Um, and, uh, and the cities themselves began to sort of really work successfully across borders, you know, reviving some of the old sort of medieval um, uh, urban acts and leagues. This is just an example of just some of the uh, uh, urban networks working across Europe. Uh, the EU also plays an important role, I think, in all of this. I mean, originally when the pre predecessor um, institutions, organizations the EU were created, they were focused very much on agriculture. It was all about, you know, funding um, and sustaining uh, farmers. Um, but in the last sort of 20 years, you know, the EU has embraced a sort of regional, I mean, particularly sort of urban agenda, started investing heavily in um, you know, in urban regeneration, so urban sustainability and so on, and increasingly making sort of interesting alliances, relationships with cities, um, you know, bypassing uh, nation states. Um, and, and, you know, European cities have led the world, uh, led, led, sorry, led, led, sort of, um, yeah, led global, global urban civil society, uh, you know, and this is just an illustration of the, of the way in which one particularly influential uh, global urban next cities network, the mayor, um, the covenant of mayors uh, originated in Europe. So all very exciting. But then as we were sort of congratulating ourselves on how good we were getting at cities with Red John Jacobs, you know, we, we, we understood how to run them. Things began to go a bit wrong. Um, and, uh, you know, you began to get a sort of anti-system, populist, um, you know, anti-liberal sentiment pronounced you know, above all in the States. We see it very clearly in Europe. This is from um, work by Rodrigo Pose and others, looking at just the increase in um, su support for political parties uh, opposed or strongly opposed to the EU. But the sort of key point, of course, is that, that all this anti-system popular sentiment had a very, very strong sort of spatial dimension, which is to say that it was much stronger outside cities than it was in cities. And it was often, often addressed to um, urban elites, and you can sort of you can see this sort of divergence in um, in sentiment and in voting patterns in London. I think you can see it particularly strongly in London, which is why I've sort of chosen this slide. But this this this, this just looks at the way the, diff the difference difference between um, party support uh, in London and, and England as a whole. And you can see that um, up until about uh, two thousand, well, it began to diverge in the nineteen nineties, um, but really diverged. Uh, in a way pronounced way from 2010 onwards. And I think that takes us back, and I could, sorry, go back to the previous graph. The crucial thing here, clearly, or a crucial thing was the, the um, banking crisis of 2008, which seems to be just a sort of uh, a game changer. Um, it's tempting when you sort of look at things like this to talk about sort of polarization. In fact, I think the evidence that I've sort of been, been, been reading about the, dis the geographical distribution of um, attitudes, of political sort of attitudes, of trust, and so forth. So it's much more of a gradient. I mean, it really is the case that people who live in the centre of cities um, are more liberal and more um, trusting of government and, and of each other than people who live uh, in the suburbs. And they're still um, more trusting than people who live in towns, and they're still more trusting and so on than people who live in villages. So it's very much a gradient. But I think what politics can do is it can create sort of coalitions around some of these groups set them against others, and we suddenly have very, very disruptive events. Um, Brexit being an obvious example, where I think, you know, a lot of us went to bed thinking that we were sort of a bit different from uh, our compatriots and woke up thinking that we were very different from them. <laughs> um, and, you know, and uh, and, I, and there was sort of quite crazy talk in the sort of, you know, the, the days, I remember I was in running centre for London then, was quite sort of, you know, there was lively talk in the capital about the capital getting independent, it was a big, um, petition got, got you know tens of thousands of signatures I seem to remember there was serious talk amongst economists about whether London might one day join the EU independently of England could we have our own visa regime and all of that um, but of course it wasn't just uh, London and England or London and the UK you know we've seen similar sort of anti-sentiment um, anti-metropolitan sentiment in, in France uh, expressed not so much in the ballot box or not just in the ballot box but on the street and you know obviously the Chile Jaune which very much um, 
uh, presented themselves as the forgotten, the bits of France that have been forgotten and neglected by uh, the metropolitan political elite. Okay, I'm going to go faster. Um, so I'll skip that. That's just to say that Gilets Jean invented their own sort of public space, but it was quite definitely outside of cities. I uh, was seeing similar things in Eastern Europe. Uh, you know, the, 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 the best case study of this is, is um, Hungary, uh, where there's been sort of ongoing battle between um, Orban's government and uh, the city and its leaders. Uh, um, but similar in Poland, where the, the last race, uh, the last presidential race um, pitted, or the last national election pitted the mayor of Warsaw um, against the uh, Justice and Law Party. Um, resulting in uh, cities of Eastern Europe creating the pact of three cities. Um, here are four white guys in blue suits, <laughs> a bit like, you know, not, not like us, um, but we've now got 32 members and very much the self-understanding of this group is it's all about standing up sort of urban liberal democracy against um, sort of black backsliding nation state. So I've just got two or three more slides and I'll stop. What, what, you know, what is, how do we sort of explain these trends. I mean, some of it, as I've said, is, is, is going to be about divergence in economic paths. Some of it, I'm sure, is about the internet and social media and the sort of effect that's having on our politics. Some of it is about big world events like the financial crisis. Um, some of it is just about sort of changing demography of uh, cities and non cities. As I've said, our cities have got sort of younger. They've got more diverse. They've got better educated. These groups tend to vote in, and and have you know at, at political attitudes of a certain kind, um, uh, and that explains a lot of the difference in values. But I think it's also what I think economists and social scientists refer to as sort of area effects. So it is the case. And this is what this sort of rather um, you know, challenging sort of series of graphs shows. Just that, uh, irrespective of your age, your income, your level of education. If you live outside a city, you're going to have more conservative views than if you live inside a city. Um, and I think it's also particular evidence that I say with Andre uh, Rodriguez Pose and others, which says that um, if you live in an area which has experienced a relative economic decline, you're going to be have particularly um, you know, uh, conservative anti-city views. So uh, last point I'm going to say is basically just ignore this. It's just to say that I think. Um, Part of the anti-city sort of sentiment is actually an anti-capital city sentiment, and it's particularly an anti-government sentiment, which translates into a sort of hostility to the city, which just happens to be at home of the government. So, you know, by I'd like to think that by and this just goes to show that despite all the rhetoric about about devolving power to cities, it hasn't really happened at the at the European level. And in fact, in the case of Hungary, in particular, you'll see that the central government has taken power back. Um, so I think sort of further decentralization could perhaps helps in this. Um, but I've also, because I've talked a lot and tried to sort of present cities and being very boosterish about cities and try to present cities, you know, in an LSE cities way as these sort of great places, which are sort of liberal and, <laughs> and diverse and, and inventive and all, all the rest of it, to recognize there's a sort of real problem here, which is that actually our cities, our capital cities, in particular our big capital cities, and I'm thinking here of places like London and Paris, have, despite all their success and their vitality and the rest of it, have become sort of sort of citadels of privilege. We've seen the urbanization of status, the urbanization of, of privilege. You know, the rents in these places are crazy. And I don't just mean the rents uh, to uh, for a room, which are crazy, but you know, the, the, the rent in the economic sense of, you know, a group of people earning a lot of unearned income just by virtue of owning city property or having the right jobs in a city. Um, I think there's sort of, you know, I think we won't get that. Addressing some of that is gonna be really, really important in mending relationships between nations and cities, if that's what we want to do. I've got some more remarks, but I think I'll stop now. Aziza is going to stand. Aziza now has an opportunity to respond. And, uh, and then Neil. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Simon. And let me um, start by thanking you for inviting me to join this very interesting conversation and uh, congratulating all of you in LSE Cities for the great work. We've been working together on a number of, of topics in recent years, and it's always a pleasure to exchange with you. 
Um, I'll try if my voice keeps me until the end, I'm a bit sick, uh, to, to react on, on the very interesting presentation that Ben provided. And I'd like to share with you three main takeaways uh, that echo or expand a bit on some of the observations you made, Ben, based on the work that the OECD has been doing over the past 25 years. So I'm not going as far as the <laughs> century old uh, paradigm shifts, but uh, over the past 25 years, mostly working directly with cities, but also with national governments on urban related matters. The first uh, main observation is more uh, a sort of outward looking perspective on how cities have positioned or repositioned themselves in the global arena and on the global stage. And they're uh, echoing some of the statements that were made. We've seen indeed in, in most OECD countries, we're talking about the club of advanced economies of the world, that um, cities have really become both pathfinders and game changers when it comes to embracing those massive global transitions that governments are struggling with, whether we're talking about climate change or demographic change or the digital revolution and its many implications, whether we're talking about globalization and its uh, discontent, uh, whether we're talking about the renewal of democracy and the trust crisis that some countries are going through. And, and there, I think there, there are two main observations I'd like to make. The first one is that what we've seen is often cities, global, large metropolitan areas uh, have uh, aimed higher than national governments, in particular when it comes to climate and environmental related policy. We've seen how in the United States, for example, to expand a bit beyond the, the EU, uh, when the Trump administration left the Paris Agreement, 300 plus mayors actually pledged to uphold uh, the climate pact at the very local level. We've seen uh, uh, similar uh, levels of ambition when it comes to net zero targets that uh, cities have set within the European Union. In over 25% of the cases, those targets set at the local level by 2040, 2050 are higher in ambition than national targets. Even when you take Scandinavian countries, such as Denmark, for example, where Copenhagen has set more ambitious targets as a capital city. We've also seen recently, uh, to give a last example, in a survey we did on energy efficiency in buildings and the role of subnational governments, that energy efficiency standards for public buildings set by local governments are higher in 90% of the cases for cities that we have surveyed than national governments. So I think there's a very interesting trend, which is that it's not only about stepping up where governments are stepping back, it's also uh, making sure that those targets to transition, maybe because cities are also part of the problem when it comes to a number of environmental externalities or have more agility or capacity to respond, but showing higher levels of ambition. And then the, the second side of this observation is that we've also seen a significant increase in their role in the global outreach or global uh, policy. It's been very interesting to see how the United States just appointed the first ever um, special representative for subnational government in, in diplomacy with Ambassador Hashingen, how uh, Blinken attended the Denver summit, you know, city summit, expressing very bold statements about the role of subnational governments in the U.S. in terms of uh, foreign policy. It's been interesting to see how the European Parliament ha has, for example, requested that national governments systematically consult with local governments when it comes to shaping their resilience and recovery uh, plans and to access a number of funds. It's been interesting to see how global arenas such as the G20 or the G7 have even mirrored with engagement groups with Urban 20 and Urban 7, uh, 7 where mayors are, are actually sitting and on a number of global agendas, whether it's the SDGs, Habitat 3, it's not that mayors wake up in the morning saying, I'm going to implement the SDGs. I think many of them do understand that this is not a compliance agenda, that they're not signing treaties, that those are committing national governments, but that these tools are somehow helping them revisit their planning strategies and their local policies, prioritize their investments in a different way, allocate budget in a different way. And down the road, fix very concrete issues that they have to address as city leaders. So I think this outward looking function goes very much in the direction of what you pointed uh, out, Ben. Uh, the second point for me is more a neat inward looking function and looking really at the role that cities are playing domestically and the types of challenges they're struggling 
with domestically. And there, I have to say, as OECD, we've been very vocal saying that a lot of the problems that mayors and city leaders have to deal with are shared responsibility with national governments to fix. And I think it would be an illusion to think that uh, uh, all these global transformations and local challenges can be fixed in a, in a vacuum because cities are, of course, not isolated ecosystems in a, in a country. And this is where, you know, uh, uh, making sure that there is an effective national urban policy that cuts across sectors, that aligns across levels of government, making sure that issues uh, that generate a lot of paradoxes and anxiety in relation to decentralization, whether it's political decentralization, fiscal decentralization, administrative decentralization and all the unfunded mandates that come uh, from, from these mismatches are addressed, go to very practical problems that local governments are struggling with today uh, in many OECD countries. And I'll just quote three of them. I think there's a first one that is really about how cities can continue to preserve their status as engines of growth in, a, in an environment that is fast changing, um, in, uh, with shifting economic power, with many conversations going now about relocation, uh, uh, disruptions in global supply chains, uh, remote hybrid environment that is uh, generating a bit of a, a tension around the spatial equilibrium. And this idea that maybe, you know, what used to be the main advantage of cities, you know, jobs and productivity is no longer enough. Uh, that many citizens are aspiring to a more multidimensional quality of life. And of course, that those cities, if they wish to remain attractive, they need to ensure these broader well being outcomes that go beyond productivity and, and jobs. And an interesting development related to that, which is going, in my sense, towards more polycentricity, making sure that countries rely on a system of cities of different sizes and that things actually happen outside capital cities and that those uh, intermediary or mid-sized cities, as we call them, also help drive, you know, some of the territorial cohesion. So preserving status as economic of, uh, engines. The second big issue we see in OECD countries is inequality and how inequality is either addressed or put under the carpet. I think this is really the social and economic bomb coming forward and just looking at income inequality, of course, a survey we just conducted at the OECD out of 26 countries shows that in half of the cases, the capital cities are actually ranking the highest in terms of income inequality, with the 20% richest actually earning 7 to, eight to 13 times more than the 20% poorest. But you could decline this on a range of amenities and public services, you know, when it comes to housing affordability, even issues related to life expectancy. And we know that the bigger the city, the larger the inequalities. And this is really an issue that, in my view, has not, uh, has not been tackled sufficiently and that has been fueled recently also by the cost of living crisis. And then there's this last point, which is really about the local national uh, kind of uh, uh, coordination and the decentralization behind these, these governance arrangements. A, a lot of heterogeneity, of course, across OECD countries. But as I said earlier, there are a number of gaps that hinder uh, the effective design and implementation of policies. And then the last point I wanted to say is, I wanted to convey for me is, is the missing piece in that puzzle uh, between cities and, and nations uh, that, 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 that uh, uh, I think is, uh, is largely untapped, which is the role of regions, that second tier of government, which we know is less vocal than, than cities globally and sometimes domestically, which we know is uh, playing a critical role in particular in the in the European context when it comes to territorial cohesion to leveraging a number of EU instruments and funds. We know regions hold huge economic prerogatives that they're rethinking also their attractiveness to people, to firms, to visitors. And I think the question of what the future of cities and nations is cannot be isolated from the question of what the future of regions are. Uh, in, in OECD countries. And I'll just finish saying that we've, we've actually done some foresight exercise at the OECD as part of the regional outlook that we're about to release. And we, we came up actually with three interesting scenarios and I'll finish here um, about the future of the regions by 2045. And there's one scenario which we call the foregone region where basically we're in a world that is 
fully centralized with top-down decision-making, reduced citizen engagement, crisis of trust. Uh, nations basically handle the major transitions I mentioned uh, earlier. There's a second scenario, which is more the interconnected regions where you have more effective collaboration across levels of government, more co-production with citizens, uh, more allocation of powers, more functional or asymmetric forms of decentralization that pay off. And then you have a third scenario, which is the region state. In the same way, we've seen sometimes the discourse around the city state, uh, where you have an aggregation of subnational entities, but no more nations, so to say. I mean, you go the extreme, the other side of the continuum, and a power shift with different ecosystems that coexist. And of course, that leads to the typical race to the bottom and competition, not only for wealth, but also for resources. So those were my main takeaways, you know, outward looking function of cities that have gained a lot of traction on the global stage, inward looking domestic challenges that require joint work with national governments, and then these intermediary levels of government that I think is not sufficiently explored in this multi-level governance that is the regional scale. Thank you very much. So I'm going to agree with a lot of that, unfortunately. Um, so look, thank you for, to LSE Cities for the invitation to respond um, to Ben today. LSE Cities is sort of the hipster wing of the LSE. Um, so it's nice to be there. Nice to see so many hipsters in the audience as well. Um, so look, let me, let me start off by saying how important I think this sort of these debates are, right? And I think that they're important for a number of reasons. That, you know, partly because some sort of solidarity is, as we know, a sort of foundation stone of democracy. And that doesn't just mean solidarity. You know, if that solidarity is somehow being broken out, broken apart by the sort of conditions where people live and the type of sort of living standards people have dependent on where they are um, in the country, then I think that really matters. It also matters hugely because there are cross-boundary issues here, which I'll, I'll talk about more later, but I think these cross-boundary issues are, they, they're hugely important in terms of sort of shaping uh, the way public policy should be done. And of course, the fact, the simple fact is that, in, you know, certainly in countries like the UK, we redistribute money from places like from London predominantly to other parts of the country. And so actually the sort of the nation state and the sort of idea that there should be some sort of like solidarity between North and South or big cities and small cities. I think that's that's really, really important. There. Now, because I'm an academic, I'm going to have a few caveats to my argument, however, right? So the first, you know, first caveat here is that, you know, we talk in broad brush terms about cities. We talk about cities as though they are sort of one thing. But the situation in London is very different to the situation in Newcastle or Stoke-on-Trent or somewhere like that. Or sort of, you know, the situation in Bern is very different to the situation in Barcelona. So we talk about cities in, in sort of one breath, and I think that's useful shorthand, but we do need to recognize that there is considerable diversity between them. We also need to recognize this diversity within them, that, you know, it's, it's a, is it 60% of people in London voted for Brexit? Is that right? I think something like that. Oh, sorry, voted again for Brexit. Vote to, vote to remain. And 60% of people voted to remain something like that. But, you know, that always staggers me that 40% of people in the city sort of, you know, voted to leave. So there's a sort of, you know, even though we have these sort of, you know, what look like large majorities in places, there's still a huge diversity of opinion, um, as we know. And actually, you know, I, I confess that in the run up to Brexit, my own sort of filter bubble was such that I didn't know many of these people. And for me, I was on the day of when Brexit happened, the day before I'd been campaigning in Brixton, where I lived, and basically I was looking around in Brixton and it was very, it became clear to me as I was knocking on doors, even in this very, very remainy place on average, that quite a lot of people were going to be voting for Brexit for reasons which I personally didn't, um, which were surprising me personally. So there's sort of, you know, sort of a few caveats there, the sort of diversity of cities. Um, and then as, you know, as Ben put up, you know, there is a sort of fuzzy boundaries. We talk about cities as being sort of, you know, clearly defined places. Clearly they're not. There's a fuzzy boundary between people who live in, you know, you know, on the in the countryside, which is on the sub, you know, the suburbs versus the sort of, you know, inner suburbs versus the sort of city centre. That's sort of slightly fuzzy. And indeed, in many places, particularly in the UK, right, we tend to think that places are cities which other people wouldn't necessarily think are cities. I'm from Oxford. Um, Oxford likes to pride itself as a city. It definitely did not feel like that when I was sort of 13, 14, 15. And when I was a teenager, it felt like a small market town. Um, and I suspect to many people, it's, it look, you know, I have, we have wonderful students here from China, 
who will come to me and say, oh, is Oxford really a city? Because I'm from a city of 10 million people, which you've never heard of, Neil. So <laughs> there's, a sort of, um, there's a sort of argument there. Um, so an important caveat there. So Ben's sort of central thesis here was about the sort of, you know, divergence of, of I guess, values or trust between um, sort of big cities and, and their sort of hinterlands or the other parts of, of the countries. And I actually think there's now overwhelming evidence for that. And I think it's suspect it has been sort of increasing. Like in my own work, we have studies which show that progressive values, there's a divide in progressive values between um, big cities and rural areas. So many values which frankly, people at LSE would take for granted around, you know, gender norms, homosexuality, things like that, you know, things which we take for granted, are, you know, often, you know, certainly my values, you know, these things are actually, you know, often, if you look in a global context, we're in a sort of minority, and we're in a minority of people who are predominantly focused in large cities um, in the global north. So that's the first sort of thing. Second thing is in terms of trust, there's been a divergence of trust in certain European cities between people in the countryside who have been less trusting of government and people in the big cities who have, who have been more trusting of government. There's this, this sort of opened up over the period of the, um, after the financial crisis. Um, and of course, you know, in, in other work, so, you know, there's a, there is a big diversity, of course. And I, in other work, I show that if you are rich in inner city, you are likely to have very different values and you're likely to be happy living in a city. Whereas if you're, uh, you know, on a relatively low income, you're much more likely to be located, you're much less likely to be happy living in a big city. And cities do deliver for some people more than they deliver for others. So I think Ben's right. Um, there's a few reasons why I think this, this sort of urban rural divide might be getting worse. One is austerity in the context of the financial, um, the financial crisis, you know, 13, you know, 15 years ago now. I think that's sort of significant. We can see that in particularly in Southern Europe, where there's been a divergence of trust, which sort of still hasn't sort of come back. Second thing is migration. You know, in Europe, we talk about migration as being a, you know, there's still a sort of, you know, in the textbooks I teach with, which are maybe 20 years old, there's still a sort of perception sometimes that migration is like a US thing. And actually, if you look at a country like Germany, Germany has a higher proportion of the population born abroad from the, than the United States. You know, migration has come to Europe and, and we need to sort of deal with that. That may be sort of challenging some people outside of the sort of um, the sort of urban core. And I think beyond that, I think there's another issue, which is mobility and actually mobility, by which I mean mobility, both in terms of whether you move to a big city. You know, it's a, a common thing for people in the UK or France or Spain. You, you grow up somewhere, you move to the big city. And often in, in these countries, there is only one big city. That's the sort of experience of mobility, which sort of opens your mind and changes you. And in my own work, I've shown that people who move, even netting out the effect of their qualifications, family background, even netting out the effect of their IQ, you know, we can show that if you move, and particularly if you move to a big city, you're more likely to hold sort of socially liberal values, and you're less likely to vote for anti-system politics, such as Brexit. So there's a sort of big sort of mobility issue here. And this feels very clear to me when we're looking at the Gilets jaunes, where you have people from the countryside you know, who, whose mobility is essentially threatened by a, a fuel tax, and that leads them to sort of protest. And you might even say that was sort of reasonable, or in my own hometown of Oxford, where we have people campaigning against low traffic neighborhoods. And the interesting thing about people campaigning about low traffic neighborhoods was the queue we had of people coming from outside of the city to come and protest against something which was restricting their mobility in the city. Whereas for someone like me, it was a, an incredibly positive thing, the low traffic neighborhoods, because I'm the sort of, I'm the beneficiary, because you know, I'm the sort of urban dweller who has to sort of breathe in the pollution and breathe in the fumes of their cars. But I'd sort of say my, my fourth thing right here, and I think one of the real problems we have here, and going back to the sort of previous two speakers, is actually we often have policy which is place, you know, place blind. So I'm stealing this point directly from the conversation we had beforehand. But the Gilets jaunes, this was an example of a national level policy which was applied everywhere with no consideration uh, so it was a fuel, essentially there was a hike in the fuel prices, that was a national level policy, and it affected people in the countryside much more than it affected people who had substitutes or alternatives they could use in the cities. So what we saw was this problem where we had people, a place blind policy which was not applied universally across the country rather than sort of sympathetic sort of local policies. So what I'd push here is I'd say that actually one of the problems we have here is that we don't have a situation where um, policy is, is clearly adapted to the needs of local areas. And one of the results of that is often that we end up with a sort of policy which is an anti-urban policy. 
essentially an anti-urban policy or an anti-urban politics where people in the cities don't like to see what's what they don't like the sort of policies which are sort of also people outside the city don't like to see the policies which are being imposed often policies which are you know more reflective of the values of sort of city dwellers so i just want to sort of you know finish up by just saying two things which i think are where we should go from here because i think you know i suspect there is growing apart i think that's you know with these big important academic caveats which are sort of too boring to talk about for too long here um, but I think there's two things which need to happen. First of all, is that actually I think we need to be thinking about our sort of common interests a little bit more. We need to be sort of trying to balance out the sort of common interests. If I'm someone who's sort of driving into the city centre every day or someone who's reliant on their car, as an urban dweller, you know, I don't, I don't run a car. I like cycling around the place. It's annoying. And we need to sort of think about our common interests. They need to think about my interests as well as I need to think about sort of their interests. And then the second thing I'd say is that we need better place-based policies, which are at a local level, which can help address these sort of, you know, problems. You know, if we're going to impose a sort of national level policy, which is going to sort of affect people in the sort of inner, in the, in the countryside more than it affects people in the city, which is to some extent unavoidable, we need some things which happen alongside that to try and mitigate the impact and make sure that we don't end up growing apart even further. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. We've got a little time for some discussion amongst ourselves. I'd, I'd just like to put a question out there about this growing apart and how to conceptualise it. Um, ben, you offered at one point one paradigm, as it were, for thinking about the growing apart of cities and nations, which is surely very familiar, but I wonder how far it goes in, in, in efforts of generalisation. It would be between on the one hand, of increasingly illiberal nation states, and you might look at Hungary, Poland, America as sort of rather, you know, clear um, representatives of that kind of movement, but perhaps we're seeing it everywhere. So it's illiberal uh, nation states, and against that, liberal cities, and the, that kind of progressive uh, modernity that would belong there. But you could flip this, I think, you could at least think about flipping it because on the one hand you could have uh on the national level although it may also have international dimensions um what you call populism which could be a radical opposition radical opposition movements against elites seen in these cities which are regarded as hollowed out um techn technocracies centrists uh dead um diversity champions perhaps but there um and so you've got this hollowed out urban life um hollowed out political parties and against and that's all the city stuff and against that you've got people who really want to fight for something meaningful uh political movements which are meaningful so which way should we look at it or is it both <coughs> um Good question. I mean, I'm quite, I'm inclined to think it's the former. I, I, I think, well, I don't think that much of the sort of um, populist or anti city or you know, that side of it is animated by concerns about social justice. I think it's more animated by concerns about you know, traditional sort of values, things around sort of you know, gender. Um, and migration sentiment um, organizations, including uh, um, international governments organizations, which is taking, taking away our sovereignty and so on. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think it's hard to sort of think of these things as really being a form of progressive politics. And I think what I, you know, Neil Humphrey began to sort of raise the question of, you know, where do we go with this and what, and what next? And I think, you know, quite much I sort of can't make that perhaps didn't make very well. So I think there are these deep trends probably taking place and what Neil's demonstrated you know, the divergence of, of, of trust um, between people living in outside cities and, and in cities. Um, paradoxically, a big divergence of trust in that you know, people living outside cities have become less trusting of government. People living inside cities remain trusting of government. People outside cities vote. God damn it. <laughs> people in the cities don't. And that's a lot of our predicament. You no, know, I mean, there's some of these sort of quite, quite small things. And this is the reason, one of the bigger point I'm going to 
want to make, which is that you know, this, there are it's political movements and political narratives that which then sort of mobilize these sort of coalitions and can make us feel much more divided than we are, and that we should be researching for narratives and agendas and things, which I think um, are more encompassing. I mean, someone like Boris Johnson was sort of, you know, he won the last election basically on a sort of, you know, leveling up anti-London ticket, you know, as part of that Brexit, because yeah. he was about Brexit, but the other, bit, the other bit of it was, was, was that. Um, and I'm, you know, just interested in trying to sort of think about what alternative politics would be, which would um, help their behind places, but also help the big cities and particular people who are sort of, you know, struggling and excluded and marginalised and disadvantaged by the way that they work, you know, and that sort of takes you onto a sort of terrain of thinking about and understanding city, cities, as these big cities, as these sort of citadels of privilege, these sort of centres of sort of you know, rent extraction um, and what you do about that. And that then begins to start thinking about things like, you know, planning reform, land tax, um, you know, even some of the things that Paul Collier, the economist, is writing about, about actually, and this is a place specific policy, thinking about sort of forms of corporate taxation and income tax, which are higher for businesses, urban businesses, um, which, you know, only kids who by universities and have to have parents who live there or in the city who can get access to. I think, I think that if, if you look at France, uh, does the pattern that Ben describes of the uh, illiberal nation state, the liberal city, does it ring true to French experience today? I think you have a um... You have a, a very high degree of heterogeneity um, within cities and rural areas. I mean, in the same way, you have diverse situations for cities, you have diverse situations for rural areas. Whether you're close to a metropolitan area or not doesn't, doesn't bear the same implications. I have examples of cities in France that are run by mayors from the extreme right, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and we're not talking yeah. about small towns, we're yeah. talking about Bézier, we're talking about Perpignan, I... we're not talking about large metropolitan areas either, but, but I think uh, what used to be maybe a more uh, clear-cut divide between rural and urban for this geography of discontent, I think is being challenged these days. I think um, you... The you... themselves uh, very ambiguously uh, React, you know, if you just say, Oh, this reactionary farmers from France, well, they weren't just that, were they? they I were think that. it started, uh, what we call with the, uh, the, the, the revolution of the rond point, the roundabout revolution, and indeed, it, it started, as you rightly said, from a situation where there was an attempt at applying an economic instrument, a, a carbon tax, in a completely place blind fashion, and of course, if you are an urban dweller living in Paris or one of the metro areas and you have credible alternatives to your individual car, mm -hmm. uh, public transportation, subway, etc., then you use these credible alternatives and you're not that affected by the uh, carbon tax. But if you live in a, in a rural area where we know 80% of households in rural remote areas in France hold at least a car, then you're affected disproportionately. So it started that way. But I think the discontent we are seeing now, for example, with the pension reform, uh, the solid waste crisis in Paris that is also linked to the pension reform and related strikes is no longer a rural urban dichotomy. I think there's it, it's much more granular now. You have pockets of discontents within very urban areas and you have a sort of new geography of better quality well-being in some rural areas, I think. So I'm, I'm not sure we would be in this sort of a more, more you know, black and white uh, type of, of observations, but, but it's true that there is a, a significant place-based component of uh, uh, trust metrics, which, by the way, I don't think are always the best proxy to assess democracy. Because I think the connection, the, the, the point for me is, we know, you know, that in, in the public trust survey that we did at the OECD, we see that there are, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, there, there are higher levels of trust of citizens in their local governments than in their national governments. This is, this is uh, 
uh, taken back. You can have very high level of trust in uh, authoritarian regimes right? in the same way that you can have very low level of trust in democratic regimes. So what do you account trust for? You know, I think that's that's more. But the discontent, I think, is much more uh, granular to okay. be analyzed now in, in a country like France, but also other countries that used in the past. It goes beyond this rural urban decoupling. Right. So a uh, professor of economic geography, um, when you look at this split, this growing apart, do you see primarily the paradigm of the liberal nation states and liberal cities, or do your caveats, as it were, start swimming it out <laughs> so quickly that, well, how do you, how would you see it? No, so, I mean, so there's definite urban rural voting patterns, yeah. that's pretty clear in the data. Like, you know, then my caveats start to sort of look a little bit sort of, um, I mean, you know, a lot of that is explained by the fact that people who live in cities are just younger and, right. you know, often more likely to be from you know, particular educations or um, from particular sort of ethnic groups and stuff like that. So okay, really that's a really interesting point. If you put it in age terms rather than where they live terms, so your geography becomes demographic in that respect rather than spatial in that respect. Uh, is, is, is the, is, are the real cleavages that Ben's trying to point up actually not happening between cities and their other but actually between generations yeah so there's a lot of that going on so if you if you um you know so i, I mean i can't remember the exact stats but if you you know you, you're finding like urban rural split explains like five ten percent of the variation and things and then a lot of the variation in sort of cross-national voting patterns is basically explained by you know where people are but by, by who people are, yeah. you know, essentially. But we live in a sort of, you know, in many countries, most countries, we're voting on a constituency basis. Certainly in the UK, when we're voting on a constituency basis, that means that actually where you are really matters right, from right. sort of, you know, political view. Yeah, yeah. And also because people don't think, I think very, you know, I, I started with this point around sort of solidarity between sort of urban rural areas, which is sort of, mm -hmm. you know, close to my heart. And yeah. I don't really spend a lot of time in the countryside. Um, but the, you know, and, and I think that the sort of, you know, we, we have this sort of challenge that, you know, even if generational splits are somehow expressed across places in a constituency based voting system, then that's going to lead to some sort of quite, you know, difficult spatial polarization. And I personally right. think that matters as well. Right, very good. So, Ben, how, how do you, what do you think about thought that rather than think primarily about illiberal nations and liberal cities, you actually have to look at a generational structure across Europe where you've Let's put it rather crudely, you've got radical young people who look at our politics and it looks absolutely hopeless. And older people who are desperately trying to hang on to some intelligibility of the world. Yeah. I'm not sure how um, comforting it is to sort of think that you couldn't explain most of it just by demographic factors, right. because even if that's true, you can't, I mean, for your analysis by, by Neil Hubbard, you can't explain it all. I mean, there, is, there are these place factors which are important. Um, and the reason it's particularly concerning is there's this sort of sorting going on, I think, you know, where younger people more likely to move to the city, and there are fewer younger people around, and so they're even more likely to move to the city. And then you just do get this quite stark, might be demographic, um, might be deep down demographic, but it has a sort of very clear geographical expression. Right. Right. And that's where you begin to get those sort of questions of of sort of solidarity. Super. Okay. Now we've got about 35 minutes left, and I think uh, um, it would be really nice to be able to take some questions from people here. I can't see the Comments. questions from uh, beyond. Do you, do you want to read out a question from uh, somebody who's not here at all? Yes. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, so we have uh, the most upvoted question is from Jean-Louis Missica, who's following us online. Um, I will uh, read this question out loud. In the relationship between nation states and cities, the question of power sharing is crucial. Uh, in both France and the UK, decentralization, decentralization is insufficient. It does not give enough power to cities to act, but there is enough decentralized power to prevent and block. And this flawed system creates a blame game between local and national governments. Is this not a forgotten dimension of the crisis of liberal democracies? Very interesting. The effect of this growing apart is that nobody can do anything. 
I can I can take it. So I think there's a, so I think there's quite a lot of truth in that actually. I think so. One of the things in the UK, I mean, I know it's, yeah, we're talking about European cities. One of the things in the UK at the moment is that we feel it does feel like there's a just feel like no one could get anything done. You know, this whole thing of like there's raw sewage in the rivers, and people are saying, well, how long? Look, the politicians and the politicians saying, I'll fix that. Just be quick, twenty five years, and then we sort of managed to sort of sort this out. And I think there is this sort of, you know, a sort of stasis you know, um, in some countries. And I think it, it comes from partly this sort of, you know, interaction. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's a great point. Yeah, I think that I made a, a similar point and the second takeaway, I think uh, the, uh, the uh, unfunded mandates, but also the, the mismatches that come from poorly implemented fiscal, political and administrative decentralizations are, really uh, you know big constraints you know for effective public policy uh, and outcomes in many countries and France is a good example of a, a lot of paradoxes and anxiety coming from decentralization when you know that Paris didn't have a, a mayor actually until the, the French Revolution that a lot of the decisions also remain uh, still largely centralized and to some extent I'll, I'll finish from that I think the COVID pandemic acted as an eye opener also of the the downsides of this poorly implemented decentralization. I think we've seen a temptation in many countries to re-centralize even further uh, a number of policy prerogatives. For example, health in OECD countries remains largely centralized. When you look at health-related public expenditure, uh, only 25% of it is carried out at subnational level across all OECD countries. But we saw, for example, that cities were driving many of the socioeconomic and environmental determinants of health. Even if they don't manage the box of doctors and hospitals, et cetera, they have, they, they, they have a key role to play, you know, in terms of air quality and uh, access to public space and so on. And I think it shifted a bit the conversation around decentralization and the need to really have this effective allocation of roles and responsibilities and this joint shared responsibility for a number of public policies, health being one of them. Good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great question. And I, I, mean, I think one of the key points, I show this very quickly, but you know, perhaps it's that if you're, if you're like an urbanist, you know, like we are in uh, cities, just so much policy talk about the value of devolution and de decentralization and empowering cities, you sort of imbibe it, you just think it's happening. And when you look at the, the, uh, the surveys, and I showed it very quickly from the, the EU, you know, the Gains in self government amongst cities are tiny, you know, despite the fact that the EU keeps banging on about how important this is. In a few cases, at least in European cities, they've gone backwards. Um, and I do definitely think that sort of fuels, I mean, it fuels us of anti government sentiment um, because government is so big, so centralized, so remote. Um, and then governments are side, uh, sit, uh, situated in these big successful capitals. <laughs> it's sort of fuels an anti city, anti capital city sort of sentiment as well. Um, and you know, I just, I, you know, and I think this is, and it also just fuels the sort of politics of sort of zero sum where you know, everybody is scrambling to get something from central government. And if you get something from central government, then I don't get it. You know, we're actually in devolve, particularly devolve to <clears throat> physical you know, tax. Has so tax. It's something you mentioned before, Ben, that perhaps we need to highlight in some ways the, this role of the capital city. So we've got cities, nations, mm -hmm. cities, nations, the future of Europe, but capital cities, as it were, fit on both sides of the cities and the nations duality, don't they? Because they're national cities. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine a lot of cities being very, very hostile to those cities. And so it's not so much the urban and the rural as the capital. And the non capital, you know, that might yeah. be another very important yeah. Yeah. division here. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, good. We have a question right at the back with two microphones. We're equidistant from you, and they'll and chase you down. If you could say uh, who you are and you can give an affiliation if you wish to. Um, hi there. I'm, I'm Abby Sinclair, uh, EI alumna, um, but now working at Stonehaven a Political and Strategy Consultancy. And a lot of the work that I'm currently doing is about getting uh, the right, so some of your somewheres or your kind of, uh, 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 sorry, rural people on board with the messaging of climate, so realigning the messaging so that it aligns with them and trying to get um, things like onshore wind in the UK um, happening. 
Um, but on the other side, I'm a firm member of the Tofu Eating Wokarati and um, also an Australian. So I think this is a side uh, comment about the point about anti-government, sorry, anti-capital versus anti-cities. I think both things exist in Australia where we have our capital, which is not really a city. So I think they are two phenomena, separate phenomena. But my question was for Aziza. I know that you spoke a bit about uh, how we see cities perhaps holding nations to a higher standard. Um, but my view on that would be that perhaps uh, that you, do you see that as a net good or do you see that as generating backlash in that uh, folks from uh, rural areas perhaps perceive cities as a whole as undemocratic or pushing the nation forward in a way that they perhaps don't want it to go. Um, so that's kind of yeah, a question. I, to you. Um, I think some some of the response goes to what you said earlier about green factories, which we actually see. Uh, I mean, I see some in in France. Um, you know, I. I I tend to think that, you know, there's no more divide between people living in a city or people living in a rural area, uh, if I can say so. I mean, I think we, which we, it's true in Norway, uh, the threshold for a city is 200 inhabitants. In China, it's 100,000 inhabitants. So, of course, uh, what, what you may think is a city in a given place is not a um, but but then when and, and we've done a lot of work at the OECD to 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 go more granular in this degree of urbanization and 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 think in terms of functional urban areas and basically see where people work and live and how they commute and 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 think of a number of public policies in a way that they span administrative boundaries because they they hold implications you know for that economic geographies so that goes beyond you know the the inner circle of so I, I tend to think that, you know, when you're an engine of growth as a, as a large metropolitan area in a country that relies on, a, on, a, on an urbanization that is uh, polycentric and uh, quality and balanced, and that relies on a system of cities of different sizes that are well connected to their neighborhoods, then the benefits of, of, of those policies actually um, and beyond, you know, typical urban dwellers and, and, and you mitigate somehow some of these risks where the zero sum logics that you mentioned also could apply to the environmental, you know, uh, a policy with externalities of environmental areas, etc. So I, I, I think it, it depends on how you conceive your quality urbanization. If you have a quality polycentric balanced system of urbanization that should trickle down benefits that, that span beyond, you know, the pure uh, uh, urban dwellers, if I can say so. Now, it's true that there is uh, in parallel a discontent uh, that, as I said, we, we hear in France from rural areas, but not only. There are pockets uh, of, of uh, disadvantaged groups within large urban areas that are also, you know, fueling that discontent uh, on, on, on a number of, of public policies. And this is why you need place-based policies. This is why you would think that relying on local governments, you know, that have this proximity scale. Mayors always tell you, people know where I live, you know, I just can't fail. They know, you don't know where your minister lives <laughs> to some it's open. You know I mean? So so I think that this is where cities should be, you know, those also connectors and, 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 and split those divides uh, within, especially this rural urban continuum, because there are indeed, uh, when you look at OECD data, I finish here, you have roughly, 48% of the world population that lives in what we call functional urban areas above 50,000 inhabitants. This is what we define as a city. You have 28% uh, that live clearly in remote rural areas and you have this 24% in between that is this rural urban continuum. And I, I think this is where the regions as the second tier of, of government have a role to play, really to connect this rural urban uh, constituencies and, and to, to drive policies that are cohesive at a territorial scale that is not just, you know, the large metro area or, or, or the isolated uh, uh, urban urban settlement, you know. So, yeah. It's, uh... Uh, just to get the mic running again, can I just ask you to say a few words about the Australian case that you mentioned? Because we were talking about it before we came up. The, you know, the capital city is a very distinctive city. But of course, there are cases like Australia, and not only Australia, the capital city, in your case, Canberra, is 
not really the sort of center of I don't know of, of political life in a, in a more yeah. uh, general sense. Um, I'm used to being the token Australian at the EI, so this feels old to me. Um, so Canberra's about 300,000 people uh, when Parliament is sitting, uh, and that's primarily people serving government and ANU, the Australian National University. Um, it does have an undercurrent of that kind of hipster kind of soul because of the university, uh, but it is not really acknowledged as somewhere that you would go other than to go to uni or to work in politics or to work in the civil service. And it's not seen as a desirable place to live. Um, then simultaneously you have the Green Party with their, I think it's changed since I left, but the the only seats that they hold are in Melbourne. So you do have the like you you have this like very uh like woke kind of culture that exists in Melbourne but has nothing to do with the source of political decision making. Um, I mean, there are state politics that take place there, but you'll have somebody in West Australia who hates Melbourne based on the fact that it's Melbourne, but not because it make, Melbourne makes any policy over or anything that would affect them. That Thank makes you. sense. Thank you. It is very interesting that the, the, the glue, as it were, between capital and politics in, a, in the wider sense is not so strict. Anybody else in the room where we can go back to uh, Sonia? Um, Wait for the microphone, you can tell us who you are. I mean, my name is Nana, I'm doing uh, local economic development. So I have a question, promoting cities, the design of play-based policies or the success of decentralization shall depend on the local capacity. So in that sense, wouldn't that emphasizing cities uh, lead to inequality between cities? Right. Tough question, Neil. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so this goes, I mean, Ben made this point around zero sum games, right? I mean, I, and I think this is like a really big, it's like one of the big policy agendas at the moment, I think in a lot of, a lot of places in the US, they're going through, you know, where do you put the money for the CHIPS Act? Here, leveling up, one of the big things with leveling up, right, is, you know, people, there's a lot of people who think it, the money should go into the cities, but then there's a lot of ministers and politicians who think the money should be going into the sort of towns. And I think into their constituencies. Into their, <laughs> directly into their constituencies in large quantity and very visible. Um, that's what that's what people sort of think. So I think so it's absolutely it's sort of crucial. Now the danger is that we end up in this sort of stasis, right, where no one gets anything and nothing's sort of appropriate in any sort of um, sense. So the key thing here is like as I was going back, as I was talking about earlier, you need to have some sort of you know, there needs to be some sort of sense of solidarity. You know, this is European structural funds, right? European structural funds, you know, one of the sort of founding tenets of that is the idea that actually you have to have solidarity and some sort of redistribution from sort of richer places, poor places. So you need to have some sort of, you know, sense of solidarity. You need to have sort of fair, pragmatic, upfront um, sort of frameworks through which it can happen. And then, of course, there's going to be a sort of some inequality between places, but at least you have a sort of, you know, rationale for dealing with it. The problem is you end up, you know, if you don't have that sort of framework, you end up with situations such as we've had in the UK, where sort of money goes to the sort of Tees Valley, and then it turns out that, it, you know, we all knew it was political, and now we sort of suspect there were other things going on as well. And that's where things sort of get kind of difficult. Um, you know, the other key thing here, right, is having like really clear policy goals about what's, you know, what these funds are being used for. And actually too often you find that the sort of, the, the policy is sort of, you know, confused, it's not clear because of that, where the money should be going, and because of that, it's sort of not justifiable. And, you know, my final point is that's when the sort of solidarity between places starts to break down. Could I ask a sort of uh, a further complicating question to our cities, nations, uh, duality? Um, I don't know if it's even an elephant in the room, but it's definitely in the room because they're not in the room. It's the online world, right? Uh, so you've got cities, physical things, nations, spatially physical things, and online virtual realities sort of spectrally distributed over all these spaces. And uh, a lot of things happen there now. Not, not in public space. I mean, they also happen in public spaces and will continue to do so, but uh, Cities, nations are the future of Europe 
if it doesn't have if we don't have inside that some sense of the dynamics of the virtual uh we're probably looking at something medieval so uh how how so i'm trying to complicate some of the representations of city versus non-city thing it's capital city is a complicating factor not always like that but the virtual world too uh, ben i'll throw this one yeah. at you well but i mean obviously there's sort of dynamics between urbanization and um digital are very very complicated because uh the one we saw when this month first took off you know the debt of distance yeah um you know and we'll all end up living in log cabins um and quite the opposite happened right so the cities sort of surged and they became sort of more, more productive um and they got bigger um and that's because actually you know, I I think that there's lots of ways in which digital technology actually um helps make it easier to live in cities because one of the big challenges of cities is is they're full of fantastic things um but you have to find them right um, but, but which city I mean, my 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 cricket captain in Oxford uh, is called Div, and he um, he works in, he works for a company that, out of Edinburgh. Yeah, we never because then you think like okay, let me just finish my point. So you know, you're yeah, you know, you're 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 gay. You really don't want to finish because there's nobody else gay there. You move into the city, you because it's, there's lots of gay people. It's hard to find them. You spend a lot of time cruising. You've got the internet. They're all there. You know, I mean, that's facetious, but it's but it, that, so that's that's one of the reasons why people I think have actually moved to cities uh, when they continue to really flourish in the age of now. We have obviously been through with um, with COVID and you know, yeah. working something which might be a bit of a bit of a game changer. Um, you know, I would just as a purpose, I would just embrace it as something which actually makes cities even more, more, more efficient. And the city's all about efficiency. Fantastic if people want to come in three days a week instead of five. That really leaves pressure on the um, the transport system. It means you have to spend less money on new lines, um, and more people can come in and couldn't come in before because it's also quite expensive. So that's the way I would I would right. look at it. But it, it, maybe it'll be more disruptive than that. Please I think it. it's a it's a very good question because uh, actually as an economic organization we did have a lot of debates around that because from an economic standpoint indeed cities emerged out of this spatial interaction of people and firms this is what generated those yeah. agglomeration benefits that yeah. justified you know the productivity the innovation etc so when the main actually change of this pandemic compared to past pandemic happened which is the large scale digital revolution and in particular the forced tele teleworking experience you know it was quite interesting to see the agility that you know small companies but also large organizations uh, uh used to to transfer to this new normal the main question that came out of that is so what what's the future looks like you know i mean is, is are, are people going to live and there were you know theories about massive urban exodus you know in the post-covid world because and what we see actually is that most of this has not happened. It has not happened. Why? Because people don't agglomerate in cities just for jobs, that not all jobs are actually subject to teleworkability, that you have large degrees of, you know, special disparities in terms of how teleworkable your uh, job is or not. I mean, roughly 50% in Paris. And, so, so I think this this idea that we could substitute the physical proximity by digital proximity forever and have new special uh, forms of equilibrium, you know, but but we saw things happening. We saw, for example, for the wealthiest, by residentiality develop. Indeed, people got a secondary house and then they managed. But that's that's a portion of the population. We saw things happening in 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 metropolitan areas or mid-sized cities that are close to large metropolitan areas and that indeed uh, received an influx of uh, workers or teleworkers because they continue to borrow some of these agglomeration benefits because of their proximity to large metropolitan areas. We saw new trends in the revival of city centers. There's a lot of questions on the future of uh, business districts, etc. But I think for me, and I finish here, the main revolution that comes from the digital experience is the capacity we have that I think is still intact to rethink our relationship to time in cities. Oh, wow. 
this idea, you know, this sort of chrono urbanism that has been tested in many areas, but probably not to its full potential that maybe in this new world, we're not all obliged to do the same thing at the same time in the same place, like, you know, agglomerating in subways to get to the office at 9 a.m. Maybe there is a way we can synchronize differently our social and economic lives in a way that we minimize the pressure on public services, on land use, on. And some cities have tested that, you know, Paris, Rennes in France, you know, they have offices of time where they saw, for example, that, and I finished here by just postponing by 15 or 20 minutes the start time of schools or universities, they saved millions of euros that extra investment in, in, in metro subway uh, lines would have required. You know, So this time, chrono urbanism is something that is allowed by the digital revolution. And I think that goes beyond you know, my physical presence in the office or not, and something that probably could be explored going forward. That was super interesting. Time, it's not space. Neil? Well, so I made two quick, two quick points. First of all, you know, I agree that, you know, there's this sort of, you know, when we start, when COVID happened, there was a sort of binary where people said cities are dead or they're fine. And mm -hmm. basically, actually, no, they're just going to change. And they always change as a result of sort of technological change. It's one of the sort of constraints of them, right? It's, you know, we sort of adapt. So that's, you know, first one. Second thing is that I think cities more becoming sort of circuses. They're more fun places to be, you know. And, you know, like Ben was saying, if you get, you know, cities are, I saw, I saw a friend earlier today, he's not been in London for 15 years, he was like, it's great, you can get around like much more easily, mm -hmm. I can sort of navigate on my phone, I got a bike and I cycle from here to there, I can find the good coffee shops, all that sort of stuff. And I think in that respect, technology was sort of complementing his city experience, and he'll be sort of back to that. I think the unanswered question, which I think is quite interesting, is the extent to which these sort of technological changes are going to be allowing different groups to sort of leave the city and the extent to which that will have sort of political effects. And I think that's going to be quite interesting to see how that works out in a good, you know, I think it's a, it's a five, 10 year time horizon, see if it sticks, see if this sort of shuffling sticks as a result of that, see what the impact is. Okay, well, there, there are hands going up. Um, we'll take one there at the back. Thanks, uh, Ben Hawes, I'm a tech policy uh, consultant. Um, I'm really interested in in the, in the financial crisis having exacerbated on this, and, and the way that that doesn't sit right across any any simple analysis of the the impacts of the financial crisis. There's sort of something else going on, and whether it's just the probable realization that the, the people who cause the financial crisis almost certainly do live in cities, and and city and, and cities are you know associated with with excessive complexity and. You know, um, um, but I suppose, you know, and, and that is really hard to tease tease out, but in a way, if, if that is a cause, you know, how do you undo that cause? How do you un, undo the, 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 the sort of emotional or cultural impact of the financial crisis, you know, which is not quite the same as the economic impact? Mm. Very good. They work in the cities. Yeah, I think some of them live in rural Oxford <laughs> villages. <laughs> Anyway, um, I mean, I know I think it's really interesting. You wouldn't guess it would have had such a profound impact in, in as it has. Um, but I just, you know, I do that's my point about developing policies which which just do, you know, tackle some of the sort of excesses uh, associated with you know, financial services and and the rest of it, you know, and just the sheer wealth that you make. We were lucky enough to get you know, property in the city, you know. Those, those things seem to be sort of absolute priorities. The other point I made was not in response to this, but talking about place sensitive policy and raised by the Julia Jean things is that, um, you know, as we level up and as we sort of try and address direct resources to places that have been left, left behind, um, it, again, as an urbanist, you've got to be encouraging agglomeration. And this is perhaps speaks to your point about, speaks to your point about, I know, having clear, clear objectives. And I'm not interested in a sort of you know, regional policy, which is just about directing funds to people so they can sort of drive around everywhere, um, you know, and live in remote villages um, and all the rest of it. And, and there's a lot of people in the lake district who want to see, you know, London levels of expenditure on, on on transport, but definitely don't want London levels of density. And I don't think that's something that you can. I think it's you should take sort of one or the other. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yes, one here. Maybe the last question. Yeah. 
Hi there, thanks very much. Uh, Melissa Weimeyer, I'm a PhD student in the geography department here. Um, and I wanted to ask about local government capacity, um, which we haven't really talked that much about except to kind of assume that cities have local governments that have a certain level of capacity to be able to address a lot of these big challenges, whether it's climate or my research is on um, London's responses to migration. Um, and I just, uh, I don't really see that uh, that much hope in a context of real disinvestment in local government, um, that we can kind of attract people into local government that can bring a lot of policy solving or problem solving capacity to these issues. And I'm curious, what you guys see maybe even through the, the OACD um, about efforts to really build local government capacity. Um, I feel like as a PhD student, I may be in a unique position that um, working for local government in London is like, I would actually make maybe 10K more than I would as a postdoc. Um, but I feel like maybe that's you know not, not the same in most places. Thank you. It's a very it's a very good question. Actually, I've been working with cities for over a decade now, and, and each time we look at the uh, pitfalls, it's uh, we need more capacity and we need more funding. And it's true, we touch upon the more funding more systematically than the capacity. A, a few points there. I think uh, for me, it's the chicken and the egg often in the conversation. We hear uh, a lot of the anxiety that comes from failed decentralization process or complex decentralization processes comes from the fact that, ah, but they don't have capacity. So we're not decentralizing because they don't have capacity. And what we see actually is that decentralization is a learning by doing process. The more you test and you experiment and sometimes you fail and the more you build the capacity that allows you to succeed. Uh, I was talking recently to the mayor of, uh, of Helsingborg that had set in his own administration a price to fail. So it was a reward for the biggest ever mistake you can make as a city official, you know, just to exemplify, you know, the, the ex exposure to risk and the aversion to risk. So, so there's this, and, and this is where I find that processes that are relying on asymmetric decentralization, maybe you don't do the same everywhere in the country, but you have pilots where you, you test, you experiment, and you do by learning have paid off and actually then allowed for a more broader application. There's a second point for me, which is, are you talking about hard or soft capacity? And, and, and I think there's been, there's been much more attention to the hard capacity than the soft capacity. And within the soft capacity, less attention to the innovation in the public sector capacity. And, and exactly what you were saying, your capacity to attract skills, to uh, 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 you know, cut across silos, to do strategic thinking, to experiment, etc. And we did a very nice piece of work with Bloomberg Philanthropies on that. We did a survey actually across 147 cities uh, globally, where we looked really at the framework conditions that are in place to boost that local public sector innovation capacity, whether there's a dedicated team, or whether there are resources, et cetera, et cetera. And what we see is that cities that have invested in this uh, soft public sector capacity lead others by several percentage points in terms of citizen satisfaction, um, in terms of, uh, you know, housing affordability, and I could go on with a number of well-being outcomes. So we've, it's documented that when you invest in this sometimes intangible, you know, it's not the same like building a, 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 a kindergarten or a school or, a, you know, a road or intangible forms of capacity, it pays off in terms of well-being outcome. I think we have correlated that at the OECD. And I, and I think in a context, and I finish here, where maybe, you know, under dire public finance, there's a temptation to go to back to the basic, you know, services. It's important to recall that you need to advance also this sort of soft capacity of local governments to, to deliver, you know, on their mandate. And, and so I think it's a, it's an excellent point, actually, we're, we're trying to unpack that, but it's still very complex how it's done. Okay, well, with that excellent point, I'm afraid we're going to have to uh, finish for today. Uh, so just leave me to thank uh, Ben Rogers, Aziza Hunch, and Neil Lee for very interesting contributions to this thank discussion you. today. Thank you.